I'm going to continue our series in Galatians, following on from what Nick and Nathan have been teaching, which you've been, if you've been listening, has um, been, don't be tempted by false gospels, hold to the one true gospel, and that that true gospel is faith in Jesus Christ. And today, as you might have guessed from our Bible reading, we're, going to be, we're up to Galatians 3, in particular the second half of that chapter. Um, and now, I don't know every one of you deeply, but I do know enough of you to feel comfortable saying that I feel out of my depth intellectually when reading Paul's letters, and I'm sure some of you feel the same way. Because um, Paul says a bunch of stuff which just seems to make no sense. It feels chaotic. Um, he asks a lot of questions and then gives you answers which also seem to make no sense. All the while, he's calling you brothers and sisters and inviting you into a family that sounds a bit weird, especially right after he's called you a bozo and a fool. Just at the start of this chapter, he's insulted you and then called you, hey, brother, you know? Um, so we're going to unpack this together this morning. Good luck. Um, but let's pray first because I think we're all going to need the Holy Spirit's help. Lord, you are the maker of all things. And when you made us, you did so in your image. You made us with a desire to seek you. But we poisoned that to seek ourself, to enslave ourselves to death. And so often now, Lord, we continue to turn from your promise, to turn from your love, your grace, and hide in the darkness of sin. So today, Lord, I pray that your light would shine in this place, in your people's hearts, and that we would be set free from death to live free in life. That we would not feel tempted to reshackle ourselves to this world as it groans with the weight of sin. Lord, help us keep our hearts and minds fixed firmly on the cross and strive to follow you in all that we do. Help me especially today as I try to faithfully share your word. And let your will be done through me today and through your people gathered here. Amen. All right. Um, my brother works in Gunnedah and um, recently he gave someone a lift. Um, him and his wife, he gave this gentleman a lift to a conference. Um, this person, this individual, has a very good reputation and he's quite famous in his own right. It was all well and good, gave the lift to the conference and back. And then the next day, my brother received a text message. It just said, hey, thanks for the lift, enjoyed your company. But the sign off, I thought was really beautiful. It said, I want to let you know that you can count my wife and I among your friends. And I just thought, wow, what a beautiful way to sign off a text message um, and invite someone into a relationship and just be bold about it. Um, and I was kind of reminded of that here in Paul's message. He starts it off with brothers and sisters. He's being bold in naming you. And the Greek word is adelphoi. Now, I haven't studied Greek. I could be saying all of these wrong, okay? I kind of went down a rabbit hole with some Greek words. So please, if you know Greek, just give me grace. Um, now, the literal translation for this is from the same womb. And although it's a, it's got a, it's a masculine word um, and often translated as brother, that doesn't quite capture it all. Because from the same womb means given life by the same being. And the more time I spent reading Galatians, in particular this chapter, you can kind of see the patterns in what Paul is saying. This idea that we're all one, all equal, all given life and set free by one act of grace from the curse of death by one being, Christ Jesus. You see, I don't think it's an accident here that Paul opens like this to remind us that even though we are all fools, to remind us of who gives life, both to him and the Galatians then and us now as we read it today. 
And so I think it's important to remember that as we go on and as we take in Paul's criticisms, his arguments, his statements, his wisdom, we take it as being from a brother who though, although might appear powerful and well-respected in his own right, he sees himself as an equal to us, a brother from the same womb who will share in the same inheritance and is inviting us into a relationship with God. Paul goes on to talk about an everyday example of life. Um, this didn't make any sense to me um, because in actual fact, you can modify a deal or an agreement. Um, and in fact, when on a little bit of research, it was also very common in Roman and Greek law to make a business agreement and then modify it and even have it conditional. And it can even be annulled if the conditions aren't met. Um, but most theologians are in agreement that Paul is actually talking about a last will and testament type of covenant, which in Greek and Jewish law cannot be changed once written and duly established. Now, that duly established means after the death of the testator. That's what establishes the covenant. Now, it's important because what does Paul end the chapter with that we just read? He talks about our inheritance, the fact that we are all heirs according to the promise, the promise made to Abraham and fulfilled by one person, Christ. Not people following a set of rules or conditions, a promise that cannot be annulled or added to because it has been duly established through the death and resurrection of Christ. And just a little side note here, Paul keeps using this word covenant and promise, but not interchangeably. And that's important to take note of because the Greek word he chooses here is a word called diatheke. There's also another Greek word for covenant called syntheke. So syntheke means a promise between two parties that are mutually equal and where there is mutual responsibility to uphold, uphold each side of your agreement. But diatheke, the word used here, means a promise between two parties that is one directional, unilateral. Only one party has the responsibility or ability to uphold their side of the agreement. A lot of people translate that word to English as testament. It's also only really used in reference to inheritance these days. The last will and testament of an individual. One-sided agreement, a promise that gifts the inheritors, which is why in our Bibles, we have the Old Testament and the New Testament, two writings that lead to one inheritance. This kind of allows Paul to tackle the next question. A situation where the Jews are coming to the Gentile church and saying, yeah, 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 we get it. Jesus is great. We, we agree with that. And the fulfillment of the promise, you're right about that. And your inheritance will be a right standing with God. But you know how God added the law to the promise, added rules about circumcision, what you can eat, how you should wash, what you should wear to the promises he made to Abraham 430 years earlier? So we better tack that on here as well because God did that then and we should do it now. But Paul is saying you can't do that not to a human will and not to the covenant between God and his people. And don't think that the law was added to improve the promise because if your inheritance depends on that, the law, you're screwed. Nick said this last week, blessed are those who follow the law and cursed are those who don't. We can't. We can't follow the law. And the law itself is very clear on showing that to us. You see, Paul is clear in saying that if you go ahead and start adding the law or your laws to the promise, 
you end up relying on your works and your adherence to it rather than grace. And you end up refusing the promise, the true promise, the true promised land, heaven. The promise of a relationship with God, the promise of redemption. And in one of the um, books Nathan's given me to, to prep these things, there's by a theologian called Scott McKnight. And he makes this observation that in the Abrahamic covenant, the promise God made to Abraham, it's about God's universal plan, blessing all nations through Abraham, everyone. However, the Mosaic law has a very nationalistic emphasis, okay? It's about the Israelites and using them to paint a picture, to be an example of why you need redemption and that God in his grace gave Abraham a promise, not a law, so that it was unconditional, unrestrained and free to all who believe. I then think Paul can kind of preempt what the, Judea, what the Judaizers, I feel like that's a made-up word every time I say it anyway, what their next response might be. Well, why did God even bother with the law then if it kind of means nothing? That was verse 19, the start of it. Why did God, through his mediator Moses, come up with 613 commandments for the Jews to follow in addition to the promise he made to Abraham? Well, they, like us, a generally rubbish bunch of human beings, as the Old Testament is also very clear about showing us. I don't know if you've read any of Judges or Kings or things like that, and you read it and you think, you stupid Israelites. But then you kind of reflect on your own life, and it's this beautiful parallels. You see, even Paul in Romans 7 gives a really heartfelt and personal example of this, of knowing that he's just as rubbish. For I know the good itself does not dwell in me. That is my sinful nature. For, the, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. I mean, man, come on. Should have got this. Ah, this is Paul writing this, right? The man, the man who gives Peter a hard run of it, right? Peter, who Jesus says, you are my rock on which I will build my church. Paul feels the need to go to him and say, dude, you're not doing it right. Stop messing up the gospel. And then Paul looks at himself and goes, oh man, I've stuffed this up. How much more are we then to look at our lives and see what the law shows us? Ah, because the law was there because of transgressions until the seed, Christ, to whom the promise referred to had come. See, because even if you or I have the desire to do what is good, we can't, and you keep on making those same stupid mistakes again and again, and the law shows this to us. That's the purpose of why it was given. You know what? But it doesn't even just show them to us. It actually increases our sin. Just before Paul said that, he says this in verse 8, sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandments, produced in me every type of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. So, why bother with the law then? Because although it cannot impart life, cannot make you righteous or put you in right standing with God, it serves to reveal the difference between your hearts and the Lord's. The law reveals the need for the promise, which if you have faith in, will be credited to you as righteousness make you right standing with God. One of the songs we sung at the start was Christ became sin so that I would be his righteousness. That's what it's talking about. 
God bothered with the law because it kept you desiring redemption, the fulfillment of the promise through your need. It was the guardian. The law was our guardian until Christ came. And the Greek word, again, give me grace, for this word is pedagogos. Now, this is the same as where the word pedagogue is derived. That was the Greek word for the slave whose job it was to bring the school, the child, from home to school. And that slave had like a temporary guardianship over that child. But their job was to bring them to the true teacher. So the law was our guardian, our protector, to serve until Christ came, the true teacher that fulfilled the law. Paul puts a used by date on the law, until Christ came. Now that we have faith, we are no longer under a guardian, under the law. Now, some of you might be going, yay, I can do whatever I want. I'm not under the law. Um, But I want to be really clear in saying, it's not saying this. And I'll get to that in a moment. So just a quick recap. Paul here and basically in all of Galatians is hammering home the need that you don't need anything but faith in Christ. Don't add to the gospel. Jesus is enough. The risen Jesus is all you need. Have faith in him and out of that life and freedom will spring. And this made me think of something. Um, I've, I've just been learning and loving the way the Bible paints this repeated picture over and over again. If you look at Genesis 1 verse 3, and God said, let there be light and there was light. This is God's first act of creation, to separate light from darkness. What's our first act of sin? To invite darkness back in. We did that. We invited darkness into our life. We invited sin into our life when we chose to live our own way. So God, in his wisdom, gave us the law because it highlights that. We became so blind in the darkness that we didn't know what light was anymore. And so the law let us see the light, but not obtain it. That was never its purpose for us to be righteous or obtain life through the law. God then goes ahead and shows more grace with his son Jesus, who again brings light, the first act of new creation to our life. And he asks us to share in that and share out of that to the world around us. So just as any of your actions cannot affect the rising sun in the morning. So none of your works contribute to that of the risen sun. Your actions cannot create light or life. But when you feel the light and life on your face, the warmth and joy it brings, that should inspire you. inspire you to do good works. Not because you have to, but because you want to. The law and your adherence to it, your works, contribute nothing to your righteousness, but your works and deeds can stem from a righteous life that is living out of joy in the risen sun. In the book of James, it says, faith by itself, if not accompanied by actions, is dead. So your actions matter. But it doesn't say faith plus actions brings life. It's dependent on your faith, but out of that, your actions will flow. You only need one gospel. Don't add to it. But may your life be changed by it. 
It's not the law which should control what you do, but that if you have accepted the Spirit, His work in your life, your desires, you should be changing to be that, your heart should be changing to be that of your risen King. Jesus himself states this on the Sermon on the Mount. I'm not going to go through it now, but it starts at Matthew 5, and it's beautiful. He talks about it at the start, that your desires break the law just as much as your actions do. So your desires, your heart, it needs to match the heart of God. So don't even worry about the law. Worry about your heart and where it stands. And does it match that of our creator king? This brings us to the last point Paul makes in this chapter of Galatians. Being baptized into Christ and clothing yourself with Christ makes you an heir of Abraham's promise. Is it weird that I've just realized I can look there and not there? Sorry, I'm sure you've designed it like that, Christy. Goodness sake. Ah, So what does being baptised into Christ mean? Are you clothing yourself in him? I know we said don't worry about the law, worry about your heart, but I think we've got to look at the law now to understand what baptism means. You see, traditionally, historically, for the Jews, it was a ritualised washing that priests attended before entering a sacred place in particular, the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. It was the washing away of evil ways, this symbolic cleansing that a priest would do to enter the presence of God. And you see, John the Baptist, um, he learned these actions from his father, his father who was a priest, and would prepare others for entering the Holy of Holies. See, and then John, what he does is he kind of sees the Messiah coming. It's revealed to him and it's gifted to him by the Spirit, but he also sees it. His eyes are open to it. And what does he do? He starts washing people, their entire bodies, baptising them, preparing them for a sacred way of life a life that will ultimately not land them in the Holy of Holies, but in the presence of God himself. You see, being baptised by the Holy Spirit, that's your redemption. That's Christ's act of saving you. But there is still the act of sanctification to continue. The putting on of Jesus, clothing yourself in him every day. Seeking him, deepening your relationship with him. Again, going back to the Old Testament, I think the Exodus story is a really beautiful example of this. There is a people, they are living in slavery to death and they are set free through the blood of the lamb. They are then baptised as they cross the Red Sea and then they are made sacred and set apart by the law. But then they must continue. It doesn't stop there. They continue their journey through the desert to the promised land. Do you see the parallels to our life? You are all living in death then we are saved by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. We are baptised into a sacred way of life that is preparing us for entering our promised land. Although now we still travel through a desert of sort. But you know what? Even in our desert, God's bounties are still everywhere flowing water, and gifts that appear to fall from heaven. We still grumble. (laughs) See, the difference is now that on our journey, we're no longer clothed in the law. 
but in Christ. And we put him on daily as we live out the faith on our journey to God's presence. This leaves me with one last question and some self-reflection. And this is for all of us. Ah, I feel like saying in particular myself. Um, I know I'm a cup laws, consciously and subconsciously, to define who's well, living well as a Christian. Um, I feel like I pharisize my faith sometimes. Um, that's probably a made up word too. Um, I make up rules to measure others. Um, I construct my own standards. They're not smart enough or talented enough or good enough or Christian enough to be saved. And I don't know why I think like that. Because we are a redeemed people. Uh, and if we're doing this, if I'm doing this, if I'm adding law, my own laws to God's grace, are we allowing the Holy Spirit to continue his work in us? Are we putting on Christ daily? Are we being sanctified through and through? Are we acting as heirs of the promise, not heirs of the law? See, we are set free from the law. So now may your life be one that brings life and light to the world around you. May the spirit work in you and continue that and make your heart be one that mirrors Christ and a mind that seeks relationship with the creator God. Not because you think being better at these things will save you, reading your Bible more, doing other things. Those acts by themselves don't save you. But a heart that is changed wants to do them. A heart that is transformed seeks these things out of joy and wonder at his grace. May all our hearts be changed to be one like that. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, how majestic are your ways, your ways of promise and your ways of grace. May our hearts be convicted of what you've spoken to each one of us today. And may we all find joy and new life in knowing that we are heirs of the promise. May we wake up each morning and praise you for your risen son, not because of some foolish adherence to habit or because we haven't prayed enough this week, but as a response to your light and love and grace that shines on us. And Lord, even in dark times, help us rest on your grace and look forward to the day when we will rise again with you. Amen. <laughs>